Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, all right, the one helping me with the screen, you would have to follow after me. As we know in chapter 4 and 5, Paul encouraged the Ephesians with chapter 4 verse 1. And that's where he said, he said this, walk worthily of the calling with which you are called. Walk worthily of the calling with which you are called. From the really early times, Jews used to use the word walk to speak of the manner in which one would conduct his life. So in other words, when you read the word walk, it is good as live. All right? Walk and live, it means the same thing. It's just like in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. It says what? Enoch walked with God. What happened to him? Let's look at the scripture. It says, walking in close fellowship with God, then one day, who disappeared? Enoch. <laughs> because what? God took him. Isn't that wonderful? It only happened to Enoch as far as we know. Isn't it nice that you are walking, living so close to God that God say, hey, I'm going to bring you back and you don't have to experience physical death. Isn't that wonderful? So far, that's the only one. <laughs> what else? Psalms chapter 1 verse 1 says this, Blessed is the man who doesn't walk or live in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the ways of sinners. Now Paul called these efficient Christians to walk or to live worthily of the calling of God. And basically what he's trying to say is emulate, follow the life of Christ. So when we walk and we live pleasing God, that's what happens. In fact, I'm going to read another version. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. It's not on the slide. The MEV, the modern English version, says this. See then that you walk carefully. And then the New American Standard Version says this. Therefore, be careful how you walk. So this evening, for the next couple of minutes, we're having communion tonight. So... I'll try to see as best to keep to the time. And the title for this evening's message is Living Wisely or Walking Wisely. And the portion of scripture that Pastor David shared that morning, now I will tell you, is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 20. If we can have it on the screen. And now we have to go way back to the front. That's why, sorry, the one doing the projection. <laughs> I'm jumping here and there. We've got to go way back to the first slide. And let's look at Ephesians 5, 15, 20. Can I ask you to read it together with me? You ready? Be so be careful how you live. Okay, stop. You are very gentle and meek. <laughs> we are reading the Word of God. Let's stand. I think standing gives you more air in your lungs. All right, we're going to read the second portion. Okay, and now read it with gusto, read it loud, and read it with all your strength. Do we have some more? Yes, we have some more words. The next slide. Ready? Uh, don't be drunk with wine. Ready? One, two, three. That's right. And the church says, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. 
From this portion of scripture, when I read it that morning, three things, six things pop up straight away. The first thing, if you remember what you read just now, there were three don'ts. Did you catch that? There were three don'ts. Paul says, don't live. That's the message title, all right? The, the six points. Three don'ts. Don't live like fools. Secondly, he said, don't act thoughtlessly. And the third don't is, don't be drunk with wine. And at the same time, he also tells us three things that we need to do. Three things. The three things is, number one, be careful. Live wisely. And the second thing he tells us to do, know what God wants you to do. And the third thing he's saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So this evening for the next 30 minutes, by his grace, I will touch on these three points, six points. The first three don'ts, what does it really mean, all right? He said, number one, don't live like fools. Who is a fool? So I have to Google, and I always like to find definition. The definition says, sometimes we look, a fool is something like this, all right? We always have that kind of uh, thing, but it's not that, all right? A fool can be just like you are looking at me. I could and have lived like a fool. Yes, you understand what I mean later on. Definition. Definition, who is a fool? He is a person who acts unwisely or imprudently a silly person. A fool is used to describe an action or person that is not at all sensible and shows a lack of good judgment. Sometimes if someone calls you moron, don't think, wow, nice name. It is not. It's just another name for a fool. Or they call you a blockhead, a nimkompu, halfwit, idiot. That's what the dictionary says. These are other synonym words that are used as a fool. What makes a person a fool? A person who lacks judgment or sense. As I looked at the dictionary, interestingly, when I Google it, it tells you 11 ways that you can spot a fool. Did you know that? I said, wow. Anyway, I think it's non-exhaustive. It could be more. 11 ways. Okay, let's see what are they. Fools are those are people who always believe that they are always right. <laughs> you may fall into some of this category. Yeah? Number two, what is it? They hate accountability. Number three, they love blaming others and reject responsibility. Four, we've got to go quickly. Pursue personal ease rather than facing the challenge. They expect you to adapt to them. They reject instruction. Seven, can't see their foolishness. Express frustrations quickly and openly. Gossip and cut down privately while outside compliment you. Ten, enjoy talking. Oh. Despise listening. Oh, I like some of you taking it down. Am I email to you? <laughs> like I said, it could be more. But it says these are 11. Then when I read that, I said, wow, two or three. I think I can identify myself to be like that. You know, fools don't seek help. Fools seek their own ways. Interestingly, it says, how do you deal with a fool? It says here, stop talking to them. Because if you are dealing with someone who is a fool, talking doesn't help. Talking only drags you into the world of a fool. Interesting. That's what a fool is like. But now, Let's look at some scriptures. 
what the scripture tells us. I Google the word, put in into a search, scriptures that tells me, that talks about fool. And I found almost seven or eight. Scriptures that describes a fool. Let's have that, the first one. Proverbs 1, 7 says, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Second one, 12, 15, Proverbs. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Thirdly, the lips of fools bring them strife, and their mouths invite a Wallopping, beating, kind of whacking. Proverbs 28, 26. Those who trust in themselves are fools. But those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. Next. People with understanding control, their anger, a hot temper shows great foolishness. If Ecclesiastes 2, 1, 14. For the wise can see where they are going, but fools walk in the dark. First Samuel 13, 13. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have not kept the commandment the Lord your God gave you. Disobedience. Psalms 41. This is the best of all. Only fools will say there is no God. Only a fool will say there is no God. And the last scripture. And when you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. Faith promise came into my mind when I saw this scripture. Was <laughs> when you fulfill your pledge, then you are wise. A fool, according to the Hebrews, lives as if he is accountable to no one. He just do what he feels like doing without thinking of the end result. You know, that's why in the days of the Israelites, they are stiff-necked people. God has been wanting to guide them and direct them. But actually, they were living like fools, disobeying God. And that's why God told them, you want to disobey me? Fine, I led you. But at the end of the day, you still have to be accountable to me. And that's why Solomon, in Ecclesiastes 11 verse 9, is not there. He tells the young people, you read it, you go back and read it, 11. Verse 9, Ecclesiastes. He tells the young people, go, go and enjoy life. It's all right. But remember, in the end, you have to answer for every one of your deeds. This is what a fool is like. So I trust that tonight you would know, as Paul tells us, do not live like a fool. A person can be the most intelligent person, man on earth though, and yet he can still be foolish in his own ways. Last point here. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. This is what Solomon said at the end of the day. You know, Solomon is a very wise man. Very wise man. And he said this. Remember, you have to account to God. So fear him and keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of men. So when you fear God, you understand that there are consequences for your actions. So whatever you do, you will take note and not live like a fool. You got it? Second one. Don't what? Don't act thoughtlessly. Again, I Google, what is acting thoughtlessly? And this is the answer I got, okay? From the dictionary.com. What is acting 
thoughtlessly, let's look at it. Acting thoughtlessly, it is lacking in consideration for others. It is being inconsiderate. And then it is characterized by or showing a lack of thought. And there's a third explanation or description. It is not thinking enough, careless or heedless, thoughtless of his health. So how do we live thoughtlessly this evening? You know, I trust that you would know, or at least is aware, there are a lot of inconsiderate people out there in the world. True or not true? I think so. And sometimes we are the ones too. It is people who don't think of anyone except but themselves. People who walk through everyday life, oblivious of the world and the people living in it. In other words, in their daily living, people act thoughtlessly. So, what are some thoughtless actions? Like you saw, do you hold the door for people when you enter the lift or when you enter into a building or you just open and you close behind you? Or do you turn back and see if there's someone else that's following you and hold the door for them? Do you chew your, with your food with your mouth open? Do you litter? In fact, when I did this point, I thought about it. Do I litter? Yeah. Sometimes I throw tissues into the drain. And my wife would say, you shouldn't do that. My rationale is, it's okay. Throw inside the drain, the water will wash it off. But she said, no, you throw inside the drain, it causes clogging. So there are two schools of thoughts. Right? Both are also correct. So what do I do now? If I'm with her, I don't throw. If I'm not with her, I'll throw. So both are also correct, okay? Or do you cut in line when you're waiting do you cut in line? You pretend and then you cut in line. Do you blast your music over your phone in public? Sometimes, have you had the experience you drive and then you stop at the traffic light and next come a car next to you and his music is so loud? Something like that. Do you knock before you enter a, a, a room itself? Do you put on your signal when you're driving? Do you wait for people to get out of the lift before you go in. Have you experienced that? When you had lift, the door opens. Before you can go out, the people all rushed in. Maybe you rushed in too. And lastly, are you always late? Thoughtless act. Are you once in a while, one time late? All right. But always, are those thoughtless actions of yours? Three scriptures. What about the scriptures? What do they have to talk to us about? Taught, acting thoughtlessly. Galatians 5, 19, 21. When I say acting thoughtlessly, it has to do with our mindset. We don't think properly. And that's why Paul tells us to the Galatians, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division. Another scripture. <laughs> oh, the same scripture it follows. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Next, Colossians 3.5. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshipping the things of this world. Lastly, Mark 7. 20 to 23. And he added, it is what comes from inside you that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, grief, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these wild things come from within. That it is what that defiles you. Acting 
thoughtlessly. If you don't think and act the way God wants you to, this can happen to you. This can be a result when you do not think and commit your thoughts to the Lord. <coughs> Thirdly, what is the third don't? Don't be drunk with wine. I won't dwell on this too much, but just a little bit. What is the Christian view on alcohol? Just a short part. It says here, throughout the first 1,800 years of church history, Christians generally consume alcoholic beverages as a common part of everyday life and use the fruit of the wine in their central rites, the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. That's the first 1,008. And then later on, in the mid-19th century, Protestant Christians moved from a position of what? Three positions. The first one, moderate, allowing moderate use of alcohol. Sometimes it's a big word. I have to ask Pastor Stephen to help me to pronounce it. More, more, moderationism. All right? Another group, abstain. Deciding that not drinking was the wisest in the present circumstances. This is abstentionism, something like that. Whew. And the last one, prohibiting all consumption of alcohol because it's believed to be a sin. Prohibitionism. Whew. I tried rehearsing this many, many times, you know, just to pronounce it. My question is, where do we stand? That's interesting. Where do we, as the Assemblies of God, stand? Which category? Ha! Huh. We stand at the second one, abstinence. In fact, I Googled, it was interesting. I found out that the Assemblies of God did a paper in 2016, 3rd August, and this is what it says. After presenting arguments from scriptures, history, science, this paper concludes, therefore, the Assemblies of God reaffirms its positions of abstinence from alcoholic beverages. This position should be proclaimed boldly and clearly throughout our fellowship, yet humbly and lovingly in faithful ministry to all. That's our stand. We advise, abstain from it. Don't drink. That is our stand. So as I thought about it, don't be drunk with wine. It's just not with wine. What about other things? Creating a habit in your lives. Just last week, I was talking to a father. And I was asking him, how's your son? He's turning about 20. He says, challenging pastor, very challenging. Because he has his own way. So I told him, he's 20, he's in college, he makes friends. But as a father, as a parent, all we can do is to counsel, give advice, monitor. Things like what? Smoking, drinking. And sometimes they will say, it's okay. Just try any. And you know what he told me? That's what happened to me, Pastor. I just tried only smoking. And at the end of the day, my life was wrecked. I became a drug addict. Just try. In fact, when he said that, oh, my, my memory was jolted back to my earliest days as a school, school boy, upper secondary school, 16, 17. It's the same thing. We have a group of friends. And I had this very good friend, good friend, buddy, best buddy, started smoking, try any. And true enough, I could see his life deteriorated into a drug addict. And later on, he passed away. Try any. And that's what happened. Try became addictive and it ruined his life. That's why Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, for it will ruin your life. What are the three don'ts? 
Don't live like a fool. Don't act thoughtlessly. Don't be drunk with wine. Conclusion. 20 minutes conclusion. 15. What are the three do's? Very interesting. Paul tells us to live wisely. In verse 15, it says this. Be very careful then how you live. Be careful how you live. I believe all of us, if not most of us, as we grew up, these two words, be careful, be careful. Probably you are the one telling your young ones too, be careful, isn't it? Be careful when you drive. Be careful when you do this. Be careful when you do that. And sometimes the hand action can mean a lot. And if it says, be careful, in other words, that comes as a warning. Be careful, then. It all depends on that finger and that hand, how it is pointed to you. Be careful. So being careful is not just about our physical being, but also for our spiritual being. Be careful how you live. I remember the last time I preached, I went around to ask some people, what are you enthusiastically about? Remember? There was a sister, she texted me after the service. Oh, pastor, I'm so glad you didn't come and ask me that question. Because if you didn't, my answer was enthusiastic about work. She enjoys work. Which I don't blame her. It's all right. If you enjoy your work, some people don't enjoy work. But today, I'm going to give you a question. Pastor David did this in our staff devotion. It was interesting. And today, I'm going to do it the same. What happens if you are given 86,400 ringgit every day? Tiffany, Celine, Anna? Anna. Anna. Because there are three sisters, so I call all the three names. Sure, we'll hit one. All right, so it's Anna, all right? <laughs> if you are given 86,400 and you cannot keep it, if you cannot use it, say, I put it into FD. Cannot. You must use it. So let's hear from Anna. What would you do with the 86,400? Uh, donate it. To who? To... Churches and schools. Okay. Young heart. Donate it, give it to churches and church and all that. If I have 86,400, I will go around and give 5,000 to every toll gate collector. Seriously. I will go around. Sometimes I see videos that I will go to McDonald's, those people who serve at the drive through and then you give them money. They are so appreciative that someone appreciates them. Let's see what Pastor Stephen will do with 86400 Buy you a ticket to an Arsenal match. <laughs> He's going to buy me a ticket to an Arsenal match. You see? He flies me there too. So you know he's a good friend. He knows what is in my heart's desire. Anyway, that desire was fulfilled last year by the grace of God. We thank God. 86,400 ringgit. But actually, if you realize that every one of us, every day, we have 86,400 seconds that's given to us every day. You don't use it, it's gone. You can't say, I keep some, use some tomorrow. So be careful with what? Paul tells us, be careful how you live. So what are we to be careful with? The first thing, we need to be careful with our time. The Bible tells us to use time wisely. Psalms 90 verse 12 says this, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Time is the most valuable thing we have. There's only so much available and once it's over, we can never, never reclaim it. God has given each one of us so much time. 
Every one of us has the same time. He doesn't have one second more or less. Same for everyone. The only problem is we really don't know how to use it well. Therefore, you and I need to be wise and use our time that God has so graciously given to us for his kingdom's sake rather than just for our sake. Time being so precious. Eliza, if you're helping me with the slide, I'm jumping quite a bit right to the end. I'm skipping Kairos and, and Kronos because I think that can be covered another time. Right to the end where it says, time being so precious. That's right. Time being so precious that you and I ought to be living as if each day was the last or the first and the last day of your life. If you know that today you only have one day to live, that's the 24 hours you have, you would live differently. Time is so precious that you and I must see and seize the God-given, ordained opportunities that is laid out before us. Thirdly, being present fully in the right now to make good use of the time. Next, understanding that every day is a gift from God and in turn choosing to rejoice and to be glad in it. And the time that is given to us to discern the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, and to recognize those moments, those teachable moments, those defining moments before us. Be careful with your time. Number two, be careful with opportunities. Colossians 4, 5 says this, Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. So it means that each day, you and I ought to, be, ought to use to the fullest potential for God's purpose and His kingdom. And we are to seize every day for God and to make every opportunity that presents itself count. You know, not everything that comes our way is from God. Do you realize that? It is true. And it's interesting, as I read, I found out that there are two tests that whatever comes our way, the good thing is there are two tests that we can use it to test if the thing, whatever it is, is from God. The two tests are, one, the great commandment test and the great commission test. The great commandment test is whether that opportunity that comes will draw you closer into a relationship with God or it won't. The great commission test is whether that opportunity that comes your way will lead, help, expand, or further the kingdom of God and in your life. So not everything that comes your way is from God. But to test it, it's a good to test. The great commandment and the great commission. And if whatever comes your way, the project, the job, whatever it is, if it doesn't help you in these two tests, then I would say, live wisely. Refrain from it. Skip it. Pass it. Because that may hinder you in your walk with God. Quickly, number two, understand what the Lord wants you to do. The Greek words tsunami suggests a deep understanding, the kind of understanding that allows a person to put together the facts and to draw right conclusion. Understanding the will of God or what God wants you to do requires time and effort. Studying the Word of God, praying, being in worship, being in service, obey the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how we can know what God wants you to do. I put here three points. In fact, I changed it a little bit from this, 
slide, you will see a slight difference. What does God want us to do? Three things. Proclaim the gospel, being a witness, serve him. And holding this, I added one point, which is found in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. A favorite scripture verse of mine. It is not on the screen. I will read it to you. The version says this, Israel, what does the Lord your God want you to do? Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. It says these words clearly. What does the Lord your God wants you to do? And he continues with this. God wants you to fear him. To fear him. That is, to reverence him. That is the meaning of the word fear. To follow all his instructions. And to love him. And to serve him. With all your heart. And with all your soul. What does the Lord God wants you to do? Paul said, we should understand, we should know what God wants you to do. And the answer, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. What does God want you to do? That you would reverend Him, fear Him, that you would love Him, and that you would serve Him with all your heart, with all your soul. That's what God wants you to do. That's what God wants me to do. There was an incident whereby a pastor was driving to a town with his wife and his two daughters. And it was raining very heavily. So heavy that the vision of sight is just maybe about 10 feet where the headlights shines. And he came to a bridge. And along the bridge, he could see signs that says, do not pick up hitchhikers. Do not pick up hitchhikers. Because right below that bridge was located an institution for the criminally insane. And it seems that once in a while, inmates would escape. And the only way to get about is to hitch a ride. And that's why they put that sign, do not pick up hitchhikers. And as they were driving closer to the bridge, and the pastor has to brake and stop because right in the middle of the road, a man was standing there, drenched, wet, waving his shirt all around, telling the car to stop, which the wife said, honey, don't stop, don't stop. Drive around him, don't stop. But the pastor had to stop. If he don't, he would run over him. So he stopped right in front of the man. And the man came and started banging on the hood of the engine, the bonnet, some of us call it. He keeps banging on it. And the pastor fell in his heart, in his spirit. He needed to go talk to this man. And obviously the wife said, don't go, don't go, don't go. But he did. He said, lock the door behind me. He got off the door. He approached the man. And he was talking to the man. And he knew what the man was trying to tell him. The man was trying to say to the pastor, don't go this way. Don't move on. The bridge is out. The bridge is out. A bus have just plunge into the river below. And when the pastor knew that, he was filled with gratitude. He hugged the man in thankfulness. If he had not stopped, he would have continued. His car would have gone right into the river. And what they both did from then on, they started waving the rest of the cars that came along that way, stopping them so that they would not plunge into the river. The bridge is out. The bridge 
is our. Today, what about us? Are we that man that would stand at the middle of the road to stop people that they will not fall into the mouth of the hell of hell? Are we there standing in the gap to say, stop, don't go this way, don't go this way, for you are heading towards damnation. Are you one of those? And having said this, what does God want you to do? Be a witness. Proclaim the gospel. And I share here a wonderful testimony for you, to you. Last Sunday, a mother with four kids came to church, four boys, 17, 15, 10, and 9. They came to church, came into the visitor's lounge. A team member shared with them the gospel. And at the end of it, pray with all of them. And they all prayed the prayer to ask Jesus to come into their life. Isn't that wonderful? So talking to the mother later during the week, I asked her, how did you come to church? She did write on the form, Maureen, and a phone number. Before I call her, I called Maureen first. I said, Maureen, do you know so-and-so, Tammy? I said, yeah, she's my colleague. I said, oh, wonderful. And she, we are both teachers in the kindergarten. Great. Maureen was the one. Maureen is a Calvarine. Her daughter serves in Kids Cat. Maureen invited Tammy to church. And Tammy came on that day. All Maureen did was to ask Tammy, come to my church, la. come, come and hear the word of God. And that's what Tammy did. And Tammy received the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, tonight, all that you and I can do, we can invite people to church so that they will have an opportunity to hear the word of God and receive salvation before they continue to go down the bridge where the bridge is out. The bridge is out. And lastly, I close with this. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't think I need to dwell on this, but let me just read from my notes here. Ephesians 5.18 says, Don't be drunk with wine, because that would ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a spirit-centered life over a life that is ruled by worldly pleasures. We are a spirit-filled church, and that's why we constantly encourage you to live a spirit-led life. It refers to our being be so under the Holy Spirit's control and leading our thoughts and life that are entirely taken up with the things of God. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to have the Holy Spirit overflowing in our lives. Church, the problem is this. However, many of us are feeding our souls and our flesh with the pleasures of the world. The reality is we really cannot be effective in our Christian life without the fullness of the Holy Spirit. If we are going to live effective, godly lives in an ungodly world, then you and I have to seek this feeling on a daily basis. Basis, and we are going to regain that fire. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, what we do in this life is not from our own effort. Rather, it is from the Holy Spirit that is at work within us, enabling us, empowering us to live a holy life that is pleasing to God. And what would you say? Amen. If the musicians could come back now. And lastly, in this portion of scripture, Paul says this, give thanks, give thanks, 
give thanks. Paul encourages us in the portion of scripture. Don't live like fools. Don't act thoughtlessly. Don't be drunk with wine, for that will ruin your life. But he tells us to live wisely. Be careful. Be careful with your time. Be careful with your opportunities. He tells us to know what God wants you and I to do. Deuteronomy 10 12. And lastly, he tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Apart from the Holy Spirit, you will find that living your Christian life will be a great challenge. But with the Holy Spirit, He will empower you, enable you, anoint your life to live a victorious Christian life. Pastor Peter is going to come and take us through communion shortly. And as Paul tells us towards the end, what a way to end this portion, giving thanks to God in everything, not for everything, in everything, give thanks to God. And I like to encourage you to do that just before we have communion. Think about it. How thankful you are. How grateful you are. How appreciative you are of God's mercy, of God's grace, of God's goodness in your life. Can I invite you to stand right now? And with your eyes closed, just focus on the Lord for a minute or two. And begin to give Him thanks, church. Give thanks to God this evening. Give thanks for what He has done for you. Give thanks for who He is to you. Give thanks. Before Victoria sings the chorus, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. You begin to thank Him right now. Thank Him for His blessing. Thank Him for your family. Thank Him for your church. Thank Him for our leadership. Thank Him for our senior pastors. Thank Him for this local assembly that you can be here to receive nourishment, spiritual food. Thank Him for your job. Thank Him for your business. Thank Him for your good health. Thank Him that today you can be found in the house of God. Thank Him that you can sleep, you can eat, you can see things that we take for granted so many times. And even as we stand before the Lord's presence this evening, I trust that we would want to come before the table of communion and we want to do it rightly and also wisely.